had a very powerful revelation this morning, very encouraging for the church, um, very positive, very encouraging, very powerful. But uh, maybe it's not time to share it yet. But just to say, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, we are gaining traction in the spirit. Amen. We are really gaining traction. We are great, gaining ground in the realms of the spirit. Um, we, we are really um, making giant strides. I'm sure you are aware. I'm sure you are aware that Okay, how many of you are aware that ever since we started praying this prayer, uh, apart from when we, we were confessing our sins and things like that, but how many of you have been aware that we have not asked God for anything? How many of you are aware of that? How many of you are aware that we have not been addressing God? This dimension of prayer... Um, is governmental in nature. In other words, we have been praying authoritatively. So our prayers have not been addressed to God, but we're addressing our prayers against um, the situations and the circumstances we needed changed. Um, you need to understand that there are certain things that we cannot ask God to do for us. And the reason why we, there are certain things we cannot ask God to do for us is because he has given us the authority. Um, you know, most, most believers think that everything that, you know, that we need or ev everything that we need corrected, every circumstance, every situation, um, we must ask God to do something about it. Yes, there are situations that need God to do about it, but there are situations that do not need God to do anything about it because God has given us the power and the authority to change things Amen. through prayer. It looks like you're surprised. Don't worry, this year, <laughs> this year, <laughs> I'm also going to talk about the power and principles of governmental praying. I think we have said, we've spoke about this before. You remember Matthew 16, 18, and 19? Jesus said to Peter, um, I say now you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven you remember that scripture Matthew 16 18 and 19 Jesus said I give you keys so the church has been given the keys now what 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 do keys represents keys represent authority So, when, when he said, I give you keys, he's saying, I give you authority. So, God gave the church authority in the earth realm to legislate for him. I give you keys of the kingdom and whatever you, 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 not I, you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So who is doing the binding on earth? Who is doing the binding on earth? The church. Who is doing the loosing in heaven? The binding in heaven? God. Who is doing the loosing on earth? The church. Now the original language, the original Greek reads this way. What you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. In other words, my responsibility and your responsibility is to find out what God has bound in heaven and bind it on earth. And to find out what God has loosed in heaven and loose it on earth. We don't just bind and loose indiscriminately. No, 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 no. What we bind on earth the Greek tense there, what we bind on earth would have already been bound in heaven. So the action starts in heaven 
and it ends on the earth. So notice God's jurisdiction of authority. He doesn't bind on earth. Where does he bind? In heaven. And what he binds in heaven, he doesn't come back to the earth to bind it. He leaves that to the church to bind it on earth. And what he loses on earth, he doesn't come to the earth to lose because he has given the church the authority to lose. So if the church does not lose on earth what God has already loosed in heaven and does not bind on earth what you know, God has already bound in heaven, what will happen is that God's will on earth will not be done. And God is not going to send an angel on earth to do his will. So God's will can be frustrated, it can be delayed if the church does not cooperate with God or if the church does not take her place and use her authority. Amen. So most of the time, you know what we do? Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, here is the devil. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will bind the devil. Lord, that all the witches that are troubling me, that, Lord, the witchcraft, Lord, send your fire. Lord, by the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me. Lord. That's religious praying that yields no results. When you say, Lord, come and help me. The devil is harassing me. Witches are harassing me. You know God, what God is saying to you? He says, but my son, I've given you authority. My daughter, I've given you authority. What does the Bible says in Luke 10 verse 19? Behold, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil. You know, James 4, 7, what does it say? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Who resists the devil? You. You resist the devil after submitting to God. And the devil will flee from you. When you deal with the devil, when you deal with witches and wizards, you don't cry out to God and say, Oh God, things are making noise on the roof of my house. Oh God, the demons are harassing my family. Oh God, there is crime in our community. Oh God, come down. Taverns are mushrooming everywhere in Tembisa. <laughs> oh God, there is unemployment in South Africa. Oh God, this coronavirus. Oh God, come down. Oh God. Lord, come and do something. God says, no, 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 no. I have already bound in heaven. You bind on earth what I have bound. And I have given you authority. And so, sometimes we delegate to God what he has already given us authority to sort out. So let me give you a key. I know we'll talk about this at the right time when we talk about um, governmental praying, the power and principles of governmental pray. The church is God's legislative assembly on earth. The church is God's government on earth. The church is God's ecclesia. So we have been given authority to legislate for God to enforce, to legislate is to enforce the laws we don't write new laws no, 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 we find out what God desires on earth we find out what his will is and we enforce it in the earth realm that is why in Matthew 6 19, Matthew chapter 6 from verse 9 says after this man I pray, our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is our responsibility to legislate for God on earth by enforcing God's kingdom in the earth realm and God's will in the earth realm by the authority that he has given us. Amen. 
So through prayer, we are to enforce heavenly decisions in the earth realm. So that the earth becomes the replica of heaven. So that God's will is done on earth as it is done in heaven. God is not the one that's going to ensure that his will is done on earth as it is done in heaven or his kingdom is done is infected on earth as it is in heaven. No, no. It is the duty of the church. There are some dangerous things that we need to you know the Lord spoke to me and he said step into your mandate you've been moving up and down step into your mandate and I know this is the area of my strength and this is part of the DNA of this house that is why after you know this series we're going to be talking about created for dominion and we're going to be talking about the triumphant church and um, we're also going to be talking about a lot of things about um, you know um, you know as part and parcel of our vision kingdom culture you know kingdom culture do you know that the church is God's colony assigned to colonize earth with the culture of heaven. Yo! That is why Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven. That's why the Bible says we are ambassadors for Christ. What is a duty of an ambassador? An ambassador represents his government, his country, in a foreign land. As a church, we have dual citizenship. In the natural, we are citizens of the Republic of South Africa. Spiritually, we are the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That is why Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. What is Caesar? Caesar represents earthly government. Give him his taxes. What is it that belongs to God? Give him his tithe. That is why the tithe is the heavenly tax. <laughs> You, you have dual citizenship and you have obligations to the two kingdoms of which you are a part of. And as a citizen, a responsible citizen of the Republic of South Africa, you must be a taxpayer. And as a responsible citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you must be a tithe payer. In the same way, tax evasion is a crime in South Africa, in the South African government, tithe evasion is a crime in the heavenly government. The Americans says, don't get me started now. <laughs> Let's come back to prayer. Now, we have been praying this way. We have not been asking God to do anything. Why? Because whatever we are dealing with does not need God to come and help us. He has already given us authority. He has already defeated the devil. He has already paralyzed him. He has already stripped him of his authority. So the devil and his cohorts, witches and wizards, the devil and all his emissaries have been paralyzed and defeated and stripped of their weapons and of their power. And we as a church have been empowered and we have been elevated positionally to sit with Christ at the right hand of the Father with all things under our feet. And, you know, because of our union with Christ, we share in, in his authority. In Christ, we are already victorious. Don't sing the song, we shall overcome. We have already overcome. That is why we wage war from a position of victory. That is why our responsibility is not to fight the devil. Listen, my brother and sister, if you are fighting the devil, then you don't understand your position in Christ. Why do you reinvent the wheel? Why would you fight the devil that Jesus fought over 2,000 years ago and defeated on your behalf? We're not fighting the devil. 
Our job is to enforce the finished work of the cross against the devil and his cohorts. That is why, that is why, what are we doing? We are decreeing, we are commanding. That is why we are not requesting, we are not talking to God because this, this session, we are dealing with witchcraft, we are dealing with the devil, we are dealing with his activities, we are dealing with, you know, witchcraft activities and so forth. And we have been given keys, we have been given authority over the enemy whom Jesus has already defeated. And the Bible says the devil and all his cohorts are under our feet. So what we've been doing now, we've been using our God-given authority over the devil and the works of the devil. And so we don't need to ask God to do anything. So don't be put off when you say, but you know we've never asked God to do it. Why, why don't we ask God to come and chase the devil? There is Barcelona Lalen. There is no scripture in the Bible that says you and I need to ask God to come and deal with the devil for us. In Mark chapter 16, one of the signs that shall follow those who believe. What is it? In my name they will cast out demons. So when there are demons, who is anointed to cast them out? Huh? Who is given authority to cast them out? You look at Luke chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 10. He gave his disciples power and authority over demons and evil spirits to cast them out. And in Mark chapter 16, it says, these signs shall follow them who believe. How many of you believe here? How many of you are believers? So, one of the signs that shall follow those who believe, it doesn't say pastors, right? It doesn't say the fivefold ministry. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they will do what? Cast out devils. So forget this thing. I'm not called to the ministry of deliverance. <laughs> you know, just like uh, many pastors, no, deliverance is not my thing. And I'm not called to the ministry of deliverance. The Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe. One of the signs is what? Casting out devils. So pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, bishops, lay people, believers. As long as you are born again, you can cast out devils. You have authority to cast out devils and demons. So you know what Bazalwane do? Whenever there's a demon that is oppressing one, their children at home, I'm waiting for pastor. Don't worry, they will pray for him at the church. You have the authority. You are not using it. You are waiting for someone to cast out a devil that you can cast out. And those who, who have gross ignorance, they are saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, here is my daughter, my only daughter. Lord, show yourself strong. And God is saying, but my daughter, I've given you authority. Have I not said in James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you? I've given you the authority. So the issue is, we all think that prayer is confined to asking God to do certain things. There are different kinds of prayers. The prayer of petition. In the prayer of petition, we ask God to do something. In the prayer of faith, we pray to God in the name of Jesus. In the prayer of supplication, we make our supplication to God. In the prayer of intercession, there are many prayers um, that are directed to God. Okay? But there are some prayers that are not directed to God. And one of the prayers that is not directed to God is the prayer of authority and now here's the thing let me make it simple anytime you deal with the devil anytime you deal with satanic opposition anytime you need a breakthrough you know exactly what the will of God is 
Anytime you want to change situations and circumstances in the earth realm, don't ask God for anything. Mark 11, 23, whoever shall say, shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his but believe that whatever he says shall come to pass, he will have whatsoever he saith. A mountain in the Bible represents a problem. It represents a, 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 you know, a, a problematic situation, a crisis, a mountain you are coming up against. Now many of us, you know what we do? We go to God with our mountains. We spend hours fasting and praying, telling God about our mountains, describing the complexity, the height and the depth of our mountains, the length of it. Father, as I'm speaking to you right now, there is nothing in the fridge. <laughs> We, we try to inform God of our problems as if God is ignorant. And we call that prayer. We tell God about our mountains. Lord, my husband is abusive. This week he beat me how many times? One, two, three. No, I'm sorry God, four times. Four. Yeah, it was on Monday and then on Wednesday. And then yesterday morning yeah uh, even today lord yeah four times i beg your pardon four times you call that prayer lord as i'm speaking right now you are holding a slip from the atm after withdrawal i have minus five rand 55 cents <laughs> as if god does not know you are describing your mountain before God. And then after describing it, you start crying. And the kids are saying, mom is really in the spirit. And then you call that prayer. And then after that, you wipe your tears. You wait for a breakthrough. Nothing happens. The Bible does not say, whoever shall describe his mountain before God. The Bible does not say, whoever shall tell God about his mountain. But whoever shall say to his mountain. So you see, Instead of speaking to the mountain, instead of using your authority to address the problem, you are talking to God about the problem. And you wonder why situations don't change. Why? Because any circumstances you need changed in the earth realm, leave God out of it. Why? Because you have been given authority here to sort things out. Remember Psalms 115 verse 16 the Bible says the heavens he created for himself but the earth he gave to the sons of men. So God will be intruding. God will be violating. God will be disorderly if he left his jurisdiction to come and interfere here on earth. That is why God only interferes on earth when we pray we release him to pray but only if we release him to fix what is within his jurisdiction to fix but if it is to change the circumstances god says i've given you the power speak to the mountain Amen. and then when you read it on it says if you speak to this mulberry tree, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can command this mulberry tree to be uprooted. Speak to the mountain. Use that authority to address the situation. But you know how we pray? We need to tell God about everything. As if God does not know. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things you tell God. There are prayers 
if it is a prayer of petition, I'm asking God to do something. But I need to make sure that whatever I'm asking God to do is within, it's what I can ask him to do. Of course, if I need a job, if I need a job, I need to pray a prayer of faith or a prayer of petition. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Now, here comes another thing. Okay, pastor. If I need healing, what must I do? Can I shock you? On the cross, Jesus died to pay for our healing. The Bible says, by his stripes you were, past tense, healed. So why are you asking God for what he has already given? I see many pastors wasting time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring your daughter before you. Lord, she's riddled with cancer from top to bottom. Lord, we thank you for your power. Mm -mm. If you're going to include the father, just say, Father, thank you that on the cross Jesus died. And by his stripes of Jesus, the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Thank you for the provision of healing. And now healing belongs to us. Now, my sister, receive your healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Why waste time with some of those long prayers in the old King James language? Okay. We'll come back here. Now. If you want to change circumstances, you have authority. If there are demons you need to deal with, leave God alone. You have authority. If you need a breakthrough and there is a hindrance in the spirit, don't talk to God about the hindrance. Discern what it is. Use the authority to deal with it. Any satanic opposition, any hindrance, anything that has to do with the devil, leave God out of it. Direct your prayers against. Here is Joshua. He's fighting against the Midianites. Um, until it was late, so he needed more time. So what did he do? He commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. He didn't say, Oh, Father, thine that is in, in heaven. I need more time to deal with the enemies. Father, stop the sun by thy power. He didn't even talk to God. He commanded the sun. Sun, moon, stop. And the sun and the moon obeyed him. This is the man who was operating in the old covenant. Uh, you remember Moses. <laughs> at the Red Sea when the children of Israel with the Egyptians pursuing from behind and the children of Israel were complaining, they were panicking and they were talk, thinking of stoning him and the Bible says he cried out to God because in front of them there's the Red Sea, behind them the enemy is coming so he cried out to God do you know how God res responded to him? Exodus 14, and I think it's verses 15 or thereabout. You know how God responded to him? He said, why are you crying to me? Tell the children of Israel to move forward. But you, lift up the rod and point it towards the sea. The rod is the symbol of authority. So God is saying, don't cry to me because the solution is in your hands. The authority to solve the problem is in your hands. Point the rod and the water will be divided. And he pointed the rod and the water divided and they walked on dry land. When they had crossed and the enemy 
you know who was pursuing behind them was following them and when everyone every, all the children of israel had crossed over and then the lord said turn the rod and point to the to the waters and he did that and the waters came back and all the enemies were drowned but god said why are you crying to me in other words this is your call it's not my call the solution is with you i've given you the authority the same rod that became a serpent and the same rod is the same rod that will part the red sea let me give you one last example jesus is crossing over to the other side with his disciples and then suddenly there's a storm and jesus is asleep in the boat and the disciples panic and they cried out master Master, don't you care that we perish? And the Bible says, Jesus arose. He didn't say, oh, Father, we are perishing. Oh, Father, look at this water getting into the boat. What did Jesus do? He, had, he rebuked the winds. He said, peace be still. Come. He didn't talk to God about the storm Joshua didn't talk to God about stopping the sun and the moon when Moses talked to God about parting the Red Sea God rebuked him and told him what to do and many of us today when we come against circumstances when we come against opposition when we come against hardships when we come against mountains when we come against witches when we come against wizards when we come against problems we pray wrong prayers and mainly we pray the prayer of petition or we pray the prayer of faith expecting God to do something when God is expecting us to do something because God God is saying but my daughter my son I've given you the authority that's your call use my authority use the power that I've given you to change circumstances use that authority to get the devil on the run use that authority to destroy all the activities of witches and wizards use that authority to revoke all evil spoken pronouncement and words against you use that authority that I've given you leave me out of this there's nothing more that I can do for you other than what I've already given you. I've already defeated the devil, the enemy of your soul. I've already defeated him and his cohorts. I've already stripped him of his authority. I have left him without an armor. I've left him without authority and I have empowered you. I've given you my Holy Spirit. I've given you my anointing. I've given you the weapons of the kingdom. I've given you my authority. So you go and deal with him and you are crying Jesus please help me and Jesus is saying what more should we do for this one and this is the problem of many believers so now why have we been addressing powers addressing we have not been addressing God is because we are praying governmentally we are using our god-given authority to change circumstances we are using our god-given authority to you know to to enforce the work of the cross against the enemy and his cohorts we are using our god-given authority to push things in the realm of the spirit that are hindering us we are using our god-given authority to cancel and to destroy the strategies and the plans of the enemy now if we need a keyboard or we need money we will go to god and ask for it if you are looking for a job the Bible says whatsoever things you desire when you pray so take your desires to God Philippians 4 verse 6 be anxious for nothing but in everything with supplication and with thanksgiving 
Let your request be made known unto God. That's the prayer of petition. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your mind and heart in Christ Jesus. So if you have requests, maybe you want a husband, or maybe you want a wife, or maybe you want a job, or maybe you want your children to be saved, or maybe you want a car, maybe you want a bigger house, or you want a better job, whatever it does you, that you want, your desires, take your desires to God in prayer. But if it is warfare related, leave God out. Does that make sense? And witchcraft is warfare related. So we leave God out. And that is why we must become a house of decrees, a house of proclamations, a house that issues commands when we deal with the enemy. Now, don't get me wrong. Prayer is not only governmental. We are praying like this because the situation, the context, demands that we pray this way. But there are other kinds of prayers. You know, you, Basalama, said dominion. You, hey, somebody needs to explain certain things to you. Do you know that there are believers, when they bless their food, they are so aggressive. Father! It's like you can say, oh, oh this is not warfare. It's not, you are talking to God, not warfare. <laughs> you know, Baba ba, aggressive wire wire. Yakaba yakotoko yo 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 parakata. Okay, we are blessing the food. This is just the food we are blessing. It's not warfare, food. <laughs> you know, I remember when we, we first taught Abba Zalwana the tabernacle prayer. Hey, everything was tabernacle prayer. The tabernacle prayer. Tabernacle prayer. When we taught them, you know, that before you get into warfare, it's important to put on the whole armor of God according to Ephesians 6. Okay, it's good within context, you know. Hey, but Abbasalwan, even when you, you, you are supposed to be doing some things, or it's a seminar, or you want to do something, and you start praying. But we are not going. We are not going for warfare. I must run a contest short time. As Kogan. You know, we should, we should know all these prayers, but we should be led by the Spirit. We should be led. You know, it's like, uh, it's like, remember when we start praying all the time, in your devotions, do that all the time. We start by doing what? Confessing our sins. Uh, that's, that's how we start. But, Basara, does it mean that in any gathering, any time, prayer has to be offered? We need to, so, oh, sh oh, 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 oh. Let's start by confessing. So at work, when they say uh, open in prayer, or there's an, or an occasion, or open in prayer, you'll say, uh, no, um, I'm going to open in prayer, but let's start by confessing our sins. <laughs> now, okay, we said God hates witchcraft, and we, we, we said witchcraft you know, the enemy uses people, you know, and witchcraft works through words in the form of curses, spells, evil decrees, bewitchments, evil vows, evil wishes, soulish prayers, and evil pronouncements. We spoke about the battles of words. Um, Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, eat of its fruit. And then in, in, we see David and Goliath in 1, 7, 1 Samuel 17, 42 through to 47, that their battle was the battle of words. Proverbs 11, 11 says, Through the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked it is destroyed. And then we looked at pronouncement. Um, we said... Um, 
to pronounce is to formally declare something. It is to give judgment. So under pronouncement, that's where curses are, that's where verdicts are, that's where hexes and vexes and enchantment. So pronouncement encompasses, you know, um, a lot of things that, that happens in the dark kingdom. Okay, now it involves the casting of spells and so forth. Now, I want us to close um, by looking at psychic and soulish prayers. What I'm going to do is, is just to um, define or introduce them. And um, remember next Sunday we are starting the series. And this is the last um, teaching because on Monday we will be praying and um, those who are going to TTF will be going there. And after TTF, that the last week is the week of praying. There will be no lectures. Uh, that's where we will be applying what we have learned here. And um, I'm going to discuss with Pastor Quena that the prayer points become tailor-made to what we have been um, talking about. So if we talk about psychic soulish prayers, the prayer points will deal with that. We talk about spells, the prayer points will be related to that. Um, and that is why I'm, I'm asking you to get the churches, um, you know, WhatsApp uh, phone number because Mwiponi, um, uh, uh, our communications department, they would put some of these prayer points in that WhatsApp so that you can get them. Everybody uh, must get them, uh, pray them at home, um, pray them for the next three months and even beyond. We will keep giving you uh, these prayer points. Now, another way in which witches and wizards, you know, um, bewitch people, control people, is through soulish prayers. We call them psychic or slash soulish prayers. This is one way the enemy manipulates the progress of believers and local churches. It is through psychic or soulish prayers. It is unfortunate that most Christians practice witchcraft in the church unconsciously because it is not only um, witches that, or people that practice witchcraft and wizardry that intentionally pray soulish prayers. Even believers pray soulish prayers. Some pray soulish prayers in ignorance, um, you know, thinking that God will answer those soulish prayers. Others uh, may be intentional. But whenever you pray soulish prayers, God is not involved. When you pray soulish prayers, God is not involved. And one way the enemy uses Christians to hinder or to derail God's work, progress and the progress of other believers is through the medium of psychic soulish prayers. And another way in which witches and wizards derail the progress of God's people and the work of God is through soulish prayers. So when, when it comes to witchcraft really, let us face it. Part of the problem is within, and part of the problem is without. In other words, we have witches and wizards that intentionally target us as believers and target God's work to bring us down, to hinder our destinies and our progress. But also within the church, we have God's people who intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously, who may be using soulish prayers amongst other things, apart from decrees and, and declarations, who may be using soulish prayers against the work of God and against other believers, and even against themselves. I'll explain. Sometimes, how does a believer... And I'll talk more about this when we get to the series. How, how, which circumstances would um, someone pray soulish prayers? Not only a believer, but a witch. You know, but certain circumstances are for the believer. 
Okay, let me start with a believer. Let me contextualize it to a believer. Uh, in which circumstances will they pray soulish prayers? They will pray soulish prayers when they are vengeful. When they want to pay revenge. When they have been offended and they want to pay revenge. They full prayers, I mean soulish prayers when they want to control. When they feel they want control. Sometimes they will pray soulish prayers when they have their own desires towards a particular person. Sometimes soulish prayers, in that instance, soulish prayers would come from a good heart. But one thing about soulish prayers is praying your own desires. Sometimes at the expense of the person you are praying for and at the expense of God's desires for that person. Case in point, here's an example. A mother grew up with a desire to get married to a lawyer. She ended up marrying a plumber. Now the desire to have a lawyer in the house is so strong. So she might decide to pray for her daughter or her son to pray that the daughter or his son will become a lawyer without consulting God, without even asking the son what the son wants to do or what the son wants to become. <laughs> so you pray, you even include God. I pray for my son, Lord, that you will give him the brains that you will provide that my son will become a lawyer in the name of Jesus and you pray and you pray your son or your daughter into law. Meanwhile, God's perfect will for your son was for him to become a doctor. So in the realm of the spirit, there is a clash. God's desire is for your son's life, the direction of your son, son's life to go up north. Your desire is for the direction of your son through soulish prayers to go west. So there is a confusion in the spirit. And this confusion plays out in the soul and the mind of your son. He may not know what's going on. But your insistence on your soulish prayers might even push him to become a lawyer and you think God has answered your prayers but it is not God it's witchcraft through soulish prayer you imposed your desires and your will in the life of your son So it is not, oh God, your will be done over my son. It is, oh God, my will be done over my son. So by doing that, you have taken the place of the creator over his life. You have even rendered the will of the creator useless. You have elevated your own desires and your own will above the will of God for your son and even above the choice of your own son. Sometimes you meant well. But that was an act of witchcraft. Don't get me wrong. To desire for your daughter to marry a good husband, to have a bright future, it's a good desire. 
You can pray generally. I pray that my daughter will have a good future. We will have a good husband. I pray that you will have a good career without prescribing the kind of career. I also gave you another example the other day. Sometimes in the church we we match make. You know in the church whenever there are single brothers we ladies have got our candidates. Yes, usban ban nimtandela usban ban. Those are our own desires and we might mean well and because of that we might start praying that these two must meet and they must marry we might even initiate it and talk to the guy and the guy might even fall for it but if he has been manipulated by the force of soulish prayers, then he has been a victim of witchcraft. I spoke to a guy in the church here a couple of years ago. I said, now tell me, what, what, what's wrong? Why are you not with your wife? Why, why are you not caring for your wife, says pastor? Uh, actually, it was not me. It was so and so and so and so that said they prayed and God told them that this woman is my wife. And I was afraid not to obey because I respected these people. And I thought if I don't obey, I might miss the will of God. So I obliged. But deep down in my heart, that is not the woman I had planned to marry. Witchcraft. So sometimes, out of a good heart, meaning well, we can end up becoming witches. Firstly, know that soulish prayers have nothing to do with God. Soulish prayers sound like one is praying to God, but unfortunately, they are not. They may be mentioning God, but unbeknown to them, whenever anyone prays soulish prayers against you, they are not praying to God. can a person claim to be praying to God? How can you be a Christian and you claim to be praying to God and you are praying against the progress of a church? You are praying that that church which belongs to God must not grow that that church, you are taking people out of that church you are praying that that church will close down you are praying that people will conf be confused. You are praying that marriages will break down in that church. You are praying all kinds of things. And you are praying to the same God who gave the men of God the, the vision to start that church. You are asking God to destroy what he built. Do you think God is... It doesn't make sense. Do you think it's, it's God will answer that kind of prayer? How can God be against himself? A couple is married because you are offended towards them. You are offended, so you pray against their marriage. And God said, you know, what God put together, let no man put asunder. But you are still asking God, using his power, to put asunder what he put together. And you claim it's God. You are praying to God. Something is wrong. You are a believer. Somebody offended you. Somebody hurt you. And you are a child of God. And when you pray in your prayer closet, you direct prayers against them. Father, I pray for Susie. May it not be well with her. Father, whatever she touches her hand, let things die in her hands. In the name of Jesus. Let things die. In, my God that answers by fire. By fire. He is my God. By fire. By fire. By fire. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Thank you, Father, for answering my prayer. You are not praying to the Father. You were on the journey of witchcraft. 
Anytime you pray against people and you are invoking God's power to judge people, to destroy people, or you are cursing people, you are a witch. You are a wizard. And in most cases, as I said, soulish prayers are vindictive prayers. Now, in the Strong's Dictionary and Concordance, one of the facets of prayer is to set in motion and maintain the momentum of what has been set in motion. So if what we speak out in prayer creates movement in the spiritual realm and maintains its momentum, which in turn releases things to happen in the earthly realm, then shouldn't we be very mindful of what we are praying? This brings me to the next question. What is a psychic or soulish prayers? Let, let me define this and then we close and go home. What do we mean by soulish prayer? Soulish prayer is a prayer spoken from our mind, will and emotion, that is the soul, in an attempt to pressure the spirit and soul of another person to move towards our desired way of thinking. So this is what I want this person to do. They have too many cars. I want them to give me one car. So <laughs> you pray that that person, you call them by name. Father, I pray that Kayala Keskosan. Lord, you know he has a BMW Cabriolet. He has a Mercedes and a Maserati. And then he has a Toyota Corolla. At least, Kayalakes Kosana, you will give me the Toyota Corolla. I claim it in Jesus' name. I claim it. Kayalake, you will not sleep. May you not sleep until you have given me the car keys in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I collect the keys now by the hook of the Lord. Wherever Kayalake is hiding the keys, by the hook of the Lord, I hook the keys. <laughs> witchcraft so all of a sudden Kayalake no longer likes the Corolla for some reason and someday and, and when he, he doesn't like the Corolla you are watching you are monitoring you, you, you are praying you become a monitoring spirit until he says no my brother you can have the Corolla and he says yes 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 thank you Jesus for answering my prayers no You've just manipulated his soul through witchcraft. Have you ever given somebody something and you felt terrible inside? There was um, my father in the faith, there was a man of God from another nation. I can't mention it by name. Um, you know, we were on the mission field and we used to go to that nation. So he came and uh, we used to give him stuff money, clothes, and all that. So, my father in the Lord, you know, accommodated him in his house just to show him love and care. <sighs> then my father in the Lord blessed him. He gave him whatever he gave him. And then the man started walking around in his study. Uh, this briefcase, this one. You know, what, I was believing God for a briefcase like this one. Um, you, this brief, it's exactly it. So my father in the Lord would not answer. Then he would move and point some other thing. And then my father in the Lord said, listen, anything you want, take, just take. And the man felt like it was a blank check. He started taking all those things. And then after a while, my father in the Lord said, hey, Ben. He said, I'm hurting my brother. I said, what is it? He said, hey. Please help me with this brother. Can you stay, can you stay with him for a weekend? <laughs> can you stay with him for a weekend? Yeah, no. You know, he, he's taken almost everything, but it's fine. It was not giving out of... 
So you pressure people until people give you things they didn't intend to give. That's witchcraft. That's manipulation. You, you wear them out. Number two, when prayers and praying is carnally motivated and out of God's will, meaning not in line with God's word, it is said to be soulish. Every time you pray outside of the bounds of God's will or God's word, that's soulish. Whether you are praying for yourself or whether you are praying for someone else, that's soulish. The Bible says, love your enemies. Bless those who despitefully use you. Anytime you pray judgment against those that have hurt you, against your enemies, that soul is praying because it's outside of the bounds of God's word. You can never give me a scripture that says pray against your enemies. Instead, the Bible says vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Bible says overcome evil with good. It says when your enemy is hungry, feed him. We don't like to think about those scriptures. I found that each time you become vengeful, God doesn't fight for you. He folds his arms because you are taking his place. Don't you think God, God is wise? Why does he say, he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Your enemies must eat at the table. Don't kill them. The Bible says we overcome evil with good. But many of us, I remember, look, I'm, 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 I'm not an angel here. <laughs> many years ago, I was hurt by the sons that I was training for ministry. Very hurt. There was a home where they used to meet and discuss me and tear me to pieces. I'm talking about young men I had raised. I had spent my time pouring in, into them, helping them. You know, some had taken members to start. Some were tearing my reputation into shreds. They were saying, I mean, not just one. I mean, at some stage, you know, we had 12 of them that disappeared. And they would have a meeting in this particular house and it belonged to a couple that came to the church and left the church. They met there, they ate there, that's where they had their meetings. And they would, and so there would be some that would come and tell me what's going on there, and which was not wise. I was also listening. So one day I got angry. Not in the spirit, but in the flesh. I take too long to get angry, but I do get angry. So I wrote prayer points. For the whole day, I sat down, I wrote systematically, I, 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 I decided this is what I want to happen to all these young guys. Systematically wrote down the prayer points. And I said, no, these ones, I need to pray exactly 12 o'clock, 12 a.m. So 12 a.m. I was in my study. I started with thanksgiving, praise and worship. And I started by building my case before God. Father, you know how much I have invested in them. You know how much, and I'm talking to God, and I'm talking to God. Now the time came when I was now supposed to unleash the curses now. I had built my case well, because I even went to the Bible. Lord, you remember that when the young people dishonored Elijah, Elisha, and they called him bold-headed man. You know that he invoked a curse and the bears destroyed all the 42 young people. And now, Father, I bring these young men that are written in this list. I take my position as an apostle and by divine authority. The moment I said I, before I could release a curse, 
it was like the Holy Spirit arrested me and I heard the voice of God speak to my spirit saying, are you sure you want to do this? And he said this to me and he said, the results of this prayer will hurt you more than the pain you feel right now. Because I have placed in you the heart of a father. And then he said this to me and he said, after you have released those curses and all those young people that, was, that I had entrusted to you to become great men, become useless. Will that bring glory to my name? Yes, they are over the rails. Pray for them to see the light. Forgive them. Then I started weeping before I could pray those prayer points. And I repented before God. I repented before God. And then I, I started studying, thinking, I don't understand a parent who curses his son or his daughter, no matter the atrocity they have committed. Do you know that if your biological son, if you are a father, and your biological son does something wrong, deserving of a curse, because the Bible says a curse without a cause shall not alight. If your son does something wrong, deserving of a curse, you as a father with your mouth, you can rubbish the destiny of your son with your, your mouth. And that's what Jacob did. Reuben, my firstborn, because you slept with my concubines, you will not excel. And that's it. When we read the Bible, Reuben, the firstborn, was not able to become who he was supposed to become. But think about this. Are you aware that when you curse your son, if you curse your son, in the loins of your son are your grandchildren. When you curse your son, you are cursing the fourth gen I mean four generations in his loins. You remember when Gehazi tried to take material advantage of Elisha? And Elisha said, I'm sorry, yeah, Gehazi. He said, May the leprosy of Naaman cling upon you and your descendants. So the leprosy of Naaman came upon Gehazi and the next generation of people who were not, who had not done anything wrong. You may gratify the desire out of anger. You may gratify that desire out of anger and you curse the person or you curse those people. But the results When you see it, unless you are not a child of God, but if the Spirit of God still dwells in you, unless other spirits have now encroached in you, and you, but if you are a true born-again child of God, you will weep when you see what your curses would have done. Sometimes I believe it's a test of character when people wrong us. To forgive and to pray... Here's one, one, one way you know you have truly forgiven. How do you know you've truly forgiven? You know you've truly forgiven uh, when you remember what was done to you. It no longer hurts. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it has to be deleted out of your memory. You could still recall it, retain it in your memory, but when you remember it, it no longer hurts. How else do you know you have forgiven, totally forgiven, when you are able to pray and bless for the people that hurt you. That's what the Bible says. It's like heaping hot coals of fire over them. It says if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
Ah, feed who? My enemy. So that he can be strong and devour me again. So what do we do, Basalwane? What we do is, so and so has hurt me. So and so, I've been hurt in the church. I've been offended in the church. You know, the leadership offended me. You go, you join another church, and you start praying against the church where you used to be a member so that it doesn't grow, so that it doesn't succeed, so that those are soulish prayers. Look, when you fight against the church in this instance, when you fight against the church, you are fighting against God, the owner of the church. Let me give you a tip. When someone is praying soulish prayers against you, please hear me. When they are praying soulish prayers against you, they are in the flesh. They are practicing witchcraft and they are in the flesh. Witchcraft is, the, is one of the works of the flesh. Now, you, if you want to overcome, remain in the spirit. Because when you downgrade and you get into the flesh and you throw soulish prayers to them, then it's flesh versus flesh. And the stronger flesh will win. But when you stay in the spirit, how do you stay in the spirit? You stay with the word. You destroy the soulish prayers. You cancel the soulish prayers. You nullify the soulish prayers. You declare God's blessings over your life, over your destiny, over your church. And you speak a word of blessing to all those that the enemy is using against you. You are heaping hot coals of... That's how to overcome evil with good. Come on! Isn't this what Joseph did? And said in Joseph... I mean in, in Genesis 50 verse 20. When his brothers... He, he, what, did he, what did Joseph say? Joseph had an opportunity to say... Aha! I told you it will end in tears. It's now my turn. What were you guys thinking you were doing, eh? Reuben, Judah. Uh, what, what were you guys thinking? You remember when you threw me inside the pit? Eh? You remember when you lied to my father? Eh? You remember when you sold me to, my, to the Ishmaelites and I struggled and I suffered and I became a slave and that woman tried to rape me and lied on me and I ended up in jail and I struggled and my reputation was messed up and destroyed and I had a reputation of a rapist. Huh? You remember, it's payback time. I don't even want to see you. Guards, take them out of fear. No. When they came and apologized, Joseph said, what you meant for bad, God turned it out for good. But prior to that, Joseph had forgiven his brothers. Instead of retaliating, he forgave. Always defeat the enemy by coming in an opposite spirit. You will dismantle and defeat the spirit of hatred when you come with the opposite spirit of love. You will always defeat the spirit of pride when you come with humility. Whenever you meet someone who is proud and they display pride before you and they display pride, you know what you do? Fight that spirit with humility. You will disarm it. But if you say, no, 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 let me also show these people who am I, man, how? How? Sauce a man, how? Make sure you don't pray soulish prayers against your enemies. Make sure you don't pray soulish prayers against wishes and wizards. Let me tell you why. Because if you pray soulish prayers, you will have no results. 
as Kulumen Trini Sobazalwan. That is why we've had so many prayer points. Fall down and die. Die, 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 die. And yet, are they dead? Back to sender, 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 back to sender. Fire, 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 fire. But even now, eh, you are still struggling. Because it's soulish prayer versus soulish prayers. <laughs> Number three, soulish prayer is a prayer spoken from our mind, fueled by emotions in an attempt to pressure the mind of another person to move towards our desired way of thinking, to accept our proposal, whether he or she likes it or not. Control. You impose your will over another person's will with or without their consent in order to fulfill your own selfish desires. Soul is praying, soul is praying, is praying on behalf of another person or yourself, by, but asking what you want to happen or what you think that person wants instead of seeking the perfect will of God and praying in accordance with it. Soulish prayers can hinder the working of the Holy Spirit. It is praying with a wrong motive. And James 4 3 says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask to spend it on your own passions. Soulish prayers commonly have selfish intent. And as I said, in soulish prayers, you are not praying to God. You think you are praying to God, but you are not. And even if it appears like they have been answered, it is not God that answered them. The last thing I want to say is this. Soulish prayers release demons. Soulish prayers are prayers that are prayed out of the flesh. And they activate and release demons to effect what you're praying for. You see, prayer to God activates angelic ministry. When Daniel prayed, the angel came and he said, I came because of your words, because of your prayers. So when you pray to God, angels are activated to take our prayers to God and to bring the answers to our prayers. But soulish prayers and curses activate demonic forces. So it is not God who answers that prayer. Uh, it's demonic forces that bring to pass what was prayed. God is not involved. Remember, it is something done soulishly outside of God's will. We don't pray our own desires on people. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and do good and he will grant you the desires of his heart. Now, Let's, let's, let's explain what that means. When the Bible says God will grant you the desires of your heart, it does not mean that anything you want, he will give it to you. Because you might want something that contradicts the scripture. It doesn't mean that you can ask God to give you another man's wife or another man's husband. Oh God, you said you will give me my heart's desires. I desire Mrs. So and so. <laughs> that, is contra that is contrary to the will of God. So when the Bible says he will grant you the desires of your hearts, you need to understand that within context, it's not your own selfish desires. It means that you and I must be so intimate with God, we must so walk with God in an intimate relationship and fellowship such that our desires synchronizes with God's desires. And when our desire synchronizes with God's desires and we have embraced God's desires for our lives, we will ask. Those are the desires the Bible is talking about. 
He will grant you the desires of your heart. Which kind of desires? The desires that are aligned to God's desires for your life. So, if you pray, you can even pray for yourself. You want something and you pray for yourself and you ask God for it and God does not want that particular thing for you or maybe you want to go to Cape Town and God doesn't want you to go to Cape Town but you pray towards that direction and you end up in Cape Town and you said God has made a way. No, you made your own way. So that is why the Bible says in 1 John 5, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will, if we ask anything according to his will, according to his will, not according to our will, not according to our own desires, but according to his will, he hears us. God is obligated to only answer a prayer that is according to his will, not according to our will. Listen. Prayer is not a way of getting God to do our will or to fulfill our desires. Prayer is not even a way of trying to break God's reluctance and get God to do what he doesn't want to do. But rather prayer is aligning ourselves with God's will. That is why one of the keys to successful praying is that before you pray and ask God for anything, find out what the word of God says concerning what you want. If, the, if it is within God's will for you to have it, then you can ask in faith. If it is not God's will for you to have it, you have no business asking God for it. You don't have money. Uh, let me just give a radical example. You don't have money. And you want to break an ATM machine and steal the money. And you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, grant unto me the strength to break and the wisdom to break into this ATM and get the money. I believe I receive in Jesus' name. And then you break into the ATM, you take the money, you say, Father, thank you, I give you praise. It is not God who gave you that wisdom. If God gave you that wisdom and power, then God has a case to answer. How can he say, thou shalt not steal, and then go ahead to answer your prayer? So, you are to protect yourself. Anything that the word of God is against, don't ask God for it. Why can you ask God? You see, it's like our children when they manipulate. It's raining and they know that when it rains, they will catch flu. They need to be in the house. Mom, can I go and play in the rain? They know the answer is no. But they are still asking. Because they want to have their way. Why would you ask God for something he has made clear in his word that it's a no? You, you're trying to change his mind, to get him to change his mind. Here's a red flag. In prayer, Basalwana, we don't command God to do what we want. If we are to command God in prayer, is to command him to do what he has promised. He said concerning the promise, my will, command ye me. So we can, we can command God to do what he has promised. And that is his word. Now any time you hear someone or you give God instructions and commands to do what you want, which is outside of the will of God, that soulish prayer, God is not involved. God does not take orders from us. He's a creator. He does not take, we can't send God on an errand. That is why true prayer is aligning ourselves to God's will. Listen to me. That's why the Bible says, ask so that you may receive, so that my name will be glorified. 
When, when God answers your prayer and you receive what you have asked for him, he gets the glory. Why? Because that is his will. His will is to bless you. His will is for you to have what you have asked for. So when the answer to prayer, when you receive what he has promised his word, he's glorified. Yeah. That is why he delights in answering our prayers. So it has to be his will. Before you retaliate with prayer and start cursing people and start, you know, killing people and start sending spiritual bombs, you people have time to create spiritual bombs. You know, you mix the thunder with the hook of the Lord and, uh, you know, you send all kinds of things to people in prayer. Sometimes some of the things we are saying, we don't even understand them. <laughs> Before you do that, is it the will of God? I have resolved in my heart that I no longer, I want to grow in prayer. I want to grow in intimacy with God. I want to grow in authority. I want to grow. And I realize that each time you play, you run around the circle of cursing people, praying soulish prayers against people, you know, throwing, you know, you know, a match with prayer points, looking for prayer points to settle scores. Each time you do that, you are not growing. You, it's the same spot. You are not making headway. Get, when you, you get prayer points, get prayer points that destroy and terminate the activities of the enemy and get prayer points that propels you forward, breakthrough. Forget about the enemies. Forget about those who are throwing spells at you. Forget about them. Don't even mention their name. Don't even pray thinking about them. Forget about them remove the faces and the names of the people in your mind witches in your family that are bewitching you you know and things like that and people that you know are jealous of you in the workplace people you know that they are bewitching you they are casting spells against you you know forgive them forgive them forgive them forgive them forgive them because remember also what the bible says mark 11 24 Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Verse 25, and when you stand praying, remembering that you have ought against someone, forgive them. For if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. And if your Father does not forgive you, then your prayers will not work. Many of us, we pray with anger. We pray with revenge. We pray with offense against the people against the witches, against the wizards, against the, our enemies. And no wonder why, no breakthrough. No breakthrough. But I'll tell you what, if we will change our attitude and we repent and we say, Lord, our eyes are open. Lord, we will pray according to the word of God and according to your will. You will begin to see breakthroughs. You will begin to see people that were fighting against you crumble. They will come and bow before you. They will come and apologize. You will see them subdued. You will see their selfish prayers, soulish prayers, just dwindling in the atmosphere. You will see them powerless and subdued. Because you are operating in a higher realm. You are walking in the realm of love. When they walk in the realm of hatred and witchcraft and manipulation and domination, you are operating in a different altitude, different level, with a different spirit. Let's stand on our feet. May our prayer points change in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word that has gone forth. We thank you. Lord, where we, we have been retaliating, fighting back in the flesh, praying soulish prayers, 
against our enemies or our perceived enemies or against people that have been praying soulish prayers against us where we have retaliated father forgive us where we have prayed soulish prayers unconsciously and consciously sometimes it came from a good heart but Lord we did not know we are asking for forgiveness and Father God, we revoke all those soulish prayers that we have prayed over those people. We cancel them by the blood of Jesus. We ask that you will have mercy over us. Help us to know how to respond to witchcraft attacks and to attack attacks by our fellow humans who are motivated and influenced by evil powers. Help us to respond according to your word and not to retaliate in the flesh. Lord, where we have gotten involved in witchcraft activities, forgive us. In the name of Jesus, wash us and cleanse us with your blood. In Jesus' name, shall we share the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Surely the angels of goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we are finishing that series on hope. The next Sunday we are starting um, revoking witchcraft. We'll go deeper and deeper and deeper. God bless you. Don't worry about the prayer points. We'll make an announcement in the church. They will be put in the church's uh, website and also in our WhatsApp. So you will get the prayer points.